your own devotional style or your own devotional practice. And realistically, we mean by this uh, is, is uh, by having a series of choices to follow in the manner of worship. Because, yes, we follow the sunnah of the Prophet The Prophet says, pray as you see me pray. Everybody has heard this hadith, this, this, this statement of the Prophet before Pray as you see me pray. We stand, we, we make ruku'a, we rise in ruku'a, we make sujood twice, we recite al-fatiha, those are things that we have to do. But we also recite a surah after Al-Fatiha. We also recite a verse or verses after Al-Fatiha. And we, we, we choose which verses to recite. So we do, we choose the verses that we recite. Choose verses. Everybody in this room has at least one Quran, if not two and five and ten and fifteen. Everybody in this room has one Quran, at least. And knowing the people in this room, that all of you have 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 had more than a passing acquaintance with the Quran, a very familiar and comfortable with the Quran, meaning that there are verses in there that touch your heart, even if you only know the English translation. Why not use those verses in your prayer? Why not? Use those verses that touch your heart. Use those surahs, those texts, those, the Quranic texts that touch your heart. Use those when you do your salah. After you recite, read the Fatiha. Read the verses or recite this, the verses of your, of your choice. Learn the text. Learn the meaning of the text that touches your heart. And use it in your prayers. And that requires something called knowing a little bit about the Qur'an. So in Fajr, in Fajr prayer, where we do this recitation out loud, recite Al-Fatiha, recite the verses that touch you, particular verses that touch you, have a method. In Zohar, recite the verses that touch you. It's a silent, you say the, 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 the uh, recitation silently, but none of that you're saying it. Recite things which recite texts which touch you. Um, some people, even here in this masjid, like one of the brothers who's not here right now, have habits of, of, for example, reading the Quran after Fajr. You know, they spend like a, you know a few minutes to read the Quran after their after their, father, their Fajr prayer. That's a wonderful thing. That's an example of, of, a, of a person or a people developing their own unique devotional style. And that doesn't mean that we, that, that we are to become hermits or that we're to become scholars. Because the truth is, and I hope this is reflected in the, in the steps that we have given, is that we know that all of us have responsibilities. We have responsibilities that we can't abandon, we can't go away from. Our time is very busy. Our time is very limited. We're all very busy. Time is very tight for us. And yet, we can still for example, pray extra prayers. Last week, or perhaps the week before, we were mentioning about uh, Tarawih. Tarawih is over in Ramadan, uh, after Ramadan. But now we have something called Tahajjid. And most of us don't have time to pray that. So my advice is, we'll just pray once a week. On the night that precedes your day off. Pray Tahajjid prayer. You see how easy that is? You just if you just schedule it to do it on the day that you have off, you know where it won't be so hard or so uh, overwhelming on you. There are, of course, many other tips that we can share. 
However, what we have attempted to do tonight is to give tips or to give steps that are easy for all of us to do. Regardless of our position in life, regardless of our occupation, and regardless of our unique uh, obligations. Islam is a faith of checks and balances. Islam does not ask us to become monks. It doesn't ask us to abandon the world, the good of living in this world. I mean, this is something that we have to emphasize a lot. I mean, the, one of the most famous supplications in the Quran, we are praying to God, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا we are praying for that which is pleasant here in this world as well as the next world. So Islam is indeed is truly a religion of balance, of checks and balances. Islam asks us to be balanced. It asks us to set correct priorities. It asks us to put a law in all things. And this is exemplified by the Prophet Allah says about him that you have in him لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُصْوَةٌ حَسَّةٌ لِمَا كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَيَوْمُ الْآخَةِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ قَثِيرًا Allah says that you have in the Prophet a goodly model for those who have hope in God who has hope in the final day and وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا and who are involved in remembering God and contemplating about God, they do it a lot. They do it often. They do it repeatedly. Islam has come down to us through all of the prophets. And peace be upon them all, alayhi wa and admittedly, the prophets of Allah, they had different um, methods, they had slightly different missions, and so they would emphasize slightly different things to their audiences. And this process concluded with the coming of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It concluded with the coming, particularly it concluded with the coming of the Qur'an to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so, practically what that means is, is that Islam, and what is Islam? It means surrender to God, submission to God. That Islam has been a finished product. It finished with the Qur'an coming to Muhammad alayhi wa sallam. There's no, for, there's no other product coming. Every couple of years, there's a new cell phone, and there's even a new Nintendo. Someone says no. Okay, fine. There's no new Nintendo. I'll take that back. But there's always new things coming up. But authentically, there won't be a new thing coming up from Allah in terms of a new religion or in terms of a new scripture, or in terms of a new prophet. That's not happening. That door is closed. And that door won't open again. So, God gives us all that we need. We may simply need to spend some time to put His guidance into practical results. And, وَمَنْ يَكْفِي اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدَ فَاسٍ تَوْسَعُونَ Obedience to Allah, obedience to Allah is that which produces the best results. And this last statement that I'm going to make, and then I'll open the floor for any um, observations or questions or reflections, is that if we don't put Islam into practice, then Islam becomes nothing more than a statement on a chalkboard. It becomes nothing more than a term on a piece of paper. It becomes nothing more than a meaningless slogan. And that's not the purpose of it. It's not meant to give us it's not meant to, to, to function as a slogan. Islam is meant to function as guidance. 
It's meant to change things for the better. It's meant to enhance whatever good is already within you. That's what Islam comes to do. The Prophet says, he says that the best of you in the days of ignorance, jahiliya, are the best of you in the days of Islam. Meaning that what Islam did is that it enhanced what goodness that already existed in the people that accepted it. If there was no goodness in there, even a little bit, if there was no goodness in there, they would not have accepted it. They would not have benefited from it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who abandon be, being full-time Muslims and rather take the job of being full-time Muslims. Any reflections or yes sir? Uh, I just want to say that uh, most things in life, if you do some research and study, it kind of covers every aspect of your life. You know, you were saying uh, how do you say this to small things? But I mean, uh, I guess if you study it, it kind of you know actually in most cases. If you're born through something by period, you find that the Islamic or the Quranic teaching on that, it actually fixes up everything that's messed up and you know, that's going on in your life. It's just that, uh, like I said, the society that we live in, you know, it says, hey, do it this way, do it this way. But the whole thing is like, uh, for marriage going on, you're having marital problems, the Quran gives you a whole list of how to do it. And it makes it to where, you know, it's going to either fix it or it's going to, you know, make sure things are peaceful. But if you do it the, uh, you know, the Western way, um, yes, domestic violence, um, all the court procedures, just everything. It costs money, time, and, and heartbroken hearts. And so the Quran comes in and it, it fixes all of that and makes sure that there's a community, there's family. Uh, it tells you how to work, it tells you about inheritance, and the thing is just that you have to be studious. You know, if you want to, you know, sometimes when things are bad, you just got to want it bad enough for it. In the worst situation, but you just you know, take the time to study it. Just do it. Yeah, that's, that's right. Any other? Yes, sir. I was wondering. Um, you probably do work in the Christian or the Muslim. Does the Jews or the Adamites and the Scotsmen who start over us around do they be altered? Um, if I understand your question correctly, then my answer to that would be that um, the overall ethos that has been given by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that that ethos never changes. So let me give a let me give a practical example from the Sunnah. Um, you know, sometimes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would pray on the back of a camel making a journey. And so today, we're not going to find a camel and make that journey. We can still pray in the car making that journey. So, the, the, and that's still in, in, in appearance to the, to, the, to, the, uh, uh, to the example that has been given to us through Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, now, there, there are... Um, um, Differences in understanding what 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 Sunnah means. There are there are differences in, in that. So, for example, um, some people they make emphasis on miswak. You know, miswak is a um, it's, it's like a little branch from a tree that is used to clean the teeth. And even in today, 2016, there are people. Who make emphasis about this about, about the miswak that you must? In fact, there is a saying that says that um, miswak is sunnah, but making fun of miswak uh, equates kufr, meaning you become a kafir by making fun by like ridiculing the miswak. So what I'm trying to say is that um, broadly speaking, the the uh, the, the prophet sunnah. Is not to be abandoned, but we have to understand what exactly constitutes the Prophet Sunnah, as opposed to, um, um, you know, things that might be particular 
to uh, his time or particular to his environment or even particular to his taste, to his own personal taste. You know, um, well, there is an example in, in the in Sahih Bukhari that, that says that, one, if, I hope I remember it correctly, it says that the Prophet uh, was brought lizard, you know, to eat lizard. And, you know, the, the Prophet kind of, you know, pushed that plate away. The way, um, you know, just kind of politely, you know, pushed away. And they said, well, is lizard haram? And the Prophet says, no, it's not haram. You know, in other words, I don't, I don't eat lizard. Maybe some other people eat lizard, but I don't eat lizard. He didn't declare it haram, right? He didn't declare it haram. But, um, so my point here is that, um, and this is the job of scholars. This is the job of people who, who, who know what they're doing. To, to, um, to sort of explain to us um, what, what we take. To explain to us the, the, the broad law or the broad uh, teachings from the Prophet. To distinguish between that which is, um, that which is general and, or that which is... Uh, um, I'll use the word mandatory. And, and, and from that which might be particular to himself or particular to his time or particular to uh, to his uh, situation. I understand your question correctly? No, usually I really ask that question. About the cat? Mm-hmm. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 To cover their head. To be Distinguishable known, from the, the non Muslim society. To distinguish. Yeah. And at that particular time, uh, the Muslim wore green turban. Now, over the course of time, we come to the top bushes or whatever. But Different. The, the thing is. To be distinguished in your dress. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, this is perhaps an example of where there is a lot of scholarly discussion. Now, um, there is a book called uh, Fiqh al and it's by an Egyptian scholar named Sayyid, Sayyid Sabik, I believe, Sayyid Sabik. And he gives an example in Fiqh al-Sunnah of, um, of, 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 of the Prophet taking, up, uh, taking off his cap and using it um, as a uh, as sutra, meaning that in the way that the way it's explained in this book is that um, and there was other examples, but that's just the one that comes to my mind. Is is that um, you know it, it wasn't seen that the prophet was trying to demonstrate that wearing a cap was not. Uh, seen as as, obli- as, a, as an obligation. Now, of course, there are different uh, scholars who have a completely different idea. And what I emphasize, what I try to emphasize, I don't know if you were in the room at that moment. What I try to emphasize is in this list here about clothing, is that um, we shouldn't be wearing clothing that's inspired by the Sunnah of Kim Kardashian or the Sunnah of Hollywood or the Sunnah of Italy or the Sunnah of France. We shouldn't be wearing those clothes. Um, and every society I, I admit has its own clothes, it has its own style, and is, and all that. And if it conforms to what is um, the, the requirements of modesty, etc., then it's perfectly fine. How? But what I did also try to emphasize is that um, you know, in, in the society that we live in, that often it is these things that keep us out of trouble. So as as the brothers were laughing at me, I will say it again, the laugh again, is that how many people are going to go to the bar on Saturday night in a jalabia and in a poofy? They're not going to do it. You know, if anything, they'll take it off. If they have that bad habit, if they have those habits, right? They're going to take these, those clothes off before they go in there. So my point here is that if if wearing these clothes, if they keep us out of trouble, then we better keep those things on. 
and, and um, um, you know, and, and even psychologically, these kinds of these kinds of uh, um, you might see them as small actions, but these even psychologically, these kinds of actions help. They help in influencing our moods, um, uh, and and they help in in letting the public know that we are not upon the same kind of life that other people are upon. That doesn't mean they're they're evil and we're we're saints, but we want to avoid as much as possible getting ourselves into the same problems, into the same troubles that others get themselves involved in. Allah says, أَفَلَا تُبُسِرُونَ Don't you see? Meaning, uh, don't you see, like, you know, we're told to look at, at um, look at the troubles that other, that other societies have gotten into and to um, um, avoid getting, repeating the same mistakes. So, you know, I admit that these things help. Cap, Jalbiya, these these things they can help in, in in keeping a lot of us out of the haram. I hope I understood your question. You know, uh, you question. Please. Uh, you, you work in the prison system. Sure. Uh, at one time there was a street against the street. Uh, About the caps? about the people mm -hmm. as being a part of our religion. Okay. And at that particular time, um, they had to allow yes. the wearing of yes. the head covering yes. as part of our religion. Has yes. that came? No, the, the brothers um, are still allowed, the only restriction is on color, on the color of the kufi. Mm -hmm. Because, um, and this is actually really relevant to the point, is that um, certain colors were associated with gangs, yeah. with certain gangs. Yeah. So, um, so if I, re if I remember correctly, the only color that's really allowed is white, maybe beige. You know, but most people, they wear a white kufi, like my like brother Yusuf here. Most people wear a, a white kufi. And some older people who have been in there, you know, for a long time, they're allowed to wear colors of their choice. But generally speaking, it's white. And, and so, the, so the institutions they ban certain color kufis, you know, in order to avoid the, uh, you know, gang affiliation um, um, so stuff. They, yeah. yeah. So, 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 translating that into street life, if if wearing these things keeps us out of trouble, it reminds us of the, to stay out of the trouble. Then we should wear them. If, if it's going to help us to stay out of trouble. And at the very least, we're wearing it or not, what we should not be wearing is, is that which, which, uh, which promotes immorality or that which looks like uh, that it promotes maybe homosexuality or that which uh, uh, may promote uh, a highly sexualized look. I mean, again, we talk about women's dress a lot, but... Men also have a code of dress, and, and uh, again, a part of it is, um, uh, or I should say, a part of the things that, that people tend to ignore, Muslim men tend to ignore, is you know we you see Muslim men wearing tight T-shirts, you know, you see um, you know wearing skinny jeans, in which they look like, you know, this emphasizing a lifestyle that is not the Islamic lifestyle. You know, and so we just as the the prisons may have told us we can't wear certain colors, then likewise we shouldn't wear certain things if they are seen as promoting an an evil or promoting um, I'll just use the term a lifestyle that is contrary to Islamic ethics. The color green is Yes, the, the color green is, is um, as you mentioned, um, there are traditions which talk about the uh, about green turban. And, um, you know, and, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, um, um, discussion in the literature about all that. But nonetheless, what it has happened in the Muslim culture is that green has become a part of the Muslim culture. But you see here, it's all green. You know, it's become part of the Muslim culture. And um, that, 
there is a great importance to that, I think. And similarly, what I, what I also what I said before is, um, I don't know if you were here at that moment, is, you know, the Muslim culture has produced things which remind us about Allah. Now, some people argue it's haram, like nasheeds, you know, those songs, that, in which, you know, it's available in every language in the world. Songs that, that, that uh, promote love of Allah, and that promote love of the Messenger of Allah, as to promote love of the deen and, and you know good vibes there are songs out there like that even though that, uh, that you'll see that a goodly number of, of scholars they say the music is, is haram period even the, even the nasheed is haram you know people that say that but the Muslim culture has nonetheless developed um, you know, a, for, yeah, but it's not an entertainment of like watching BET or MTV it's a, it is something which reminds you of Allah um, you and I are friends on Facebook. Did you see what I posted a couple like this morning? That in Tanzania, they had like thousands of people at a stadium. And if you if you saw me on Facebook, it said that that these people aren't here for a concert. They're all there attending Quran recitation. You know <laughs> that they had gathered in a place that you normally think would be a concert, but they gathered in a place to listen to the words of Allah. So um, you know these things. Um, you can call them as culturally important, but they are also important in helping us becoming full-time Muslims as opposed to part-time Muslims. Yes, brother. Uh, you were talking about the uh, like skinny jeans stuff. I'm sorry about what? I said you were talking about the skinny jeans. And sure, stuff. sure. It's like my biggest problem with that is it's like it's like 2016, mm -hmm. and so like yeah, that's those the are, style. Those are styles, but the thing is like they come to where you can buy them in your actual like you know size or up like. I see people like I see people that have the skinny over, oh those are the skinny jeans style, but they're not skinny. And then I see people who like purposely bought two sizes down for myself and it's like a big wide. Well let me let me say this. You know, the the because I, I, I have a I have a, 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 a perspective about that which I don't really want to say. But I will, what I will say is that uh, for men there is also a a modesty thing, issue. Alright? Then we talk about women wearing tight pants, or women wearing clothes that are form-fitting. But for men, we likewise are not supposed to dress like that, you know. Um, and, and even when it comes down to things like, uh, or even even shorts, right? You know, the, generally they said that you know that the, that the, what should be covered by the man, that's, I had to cover, is from the navel down to the knees. You know, it's, it's generally said like that. And you know, so you see, like Muslims sometimes they wear these shorts, or they wear these like cut-up things, and it'd be like up to here, 